Welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have Dr. Dale Bredesen back with us. He's one of our most popular yes. podcast guests. <laughs> and I think it's because he is a purveyor of rational hope. Yes. And he, the author of the international bestseller book, The End of Alzheimer's, um, there's The End of Alzheimer's Program. He published a study showing that you could reverse Alzheimer's. Um, that was huge. It got international press. And I just love him. I love uh, his work. And at, at a time of pandemic, mm -hmm. when the isolation, which we know, Dale, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, the chronic stress, the people gained weight during this time. How do people manage their brains during a pandemic? You know, that's a great point. And it's always great to talk to you too. And as you indicated, the people get what's called a COVID cushion. They get that extra yeah. 10 or 20 pounds with COVID-19 as they're sitting inside. And, uh, you know, many of us are doing a little uh, worry eating. Uh, and the, the social isolation. And, you know, we saw this uh, on the trial that we just finished. We a very exciting trial finished in December. And many people would improve. And then toward the end of it, as COVID hit, when we were toward the end of our trial, people would have a little fall off at the end because of all these things. As you know, there's more depression. There's more anxiety. I mean, this is, this is your area of great expertise. So I think you're right. And I think that you have to Essentially, we're changing the way we think about living on a day-to-day -day basis. We're, you know, even though we may be sheltering in place and social distancing, um, we're able to do more family things. We're able to do more with our pod, with our group. We're able to get out there. I, I find, you know, don't have to don't have to fly as much as I used yeah. to. Get out there and uh, been playing some pickleball with the family. Get out there and hit some tennis balls. Get out there and do some biking and some swimming and all the things that you may not have had time to do before. Um, and I think you know it's a time to pull your network together uh, mm -hmm. and to and to have more interaction. Mm -hmm. And you're right, you do have to spend more time thinking about what you're putting in your mouth. No question about it. And you know, I think one of the things that's helped is all of the wearables, all of the quantified self. It is a time when you can follow yourself and it's even more important to get that feedback, whether you like to use Oura Ring, whether you like to use, I like my Apple Watch, so check my heart rate variability every day. I can check how much sleep I've been doing and do the breathe exercise several times a day. You know, whether, whether you like meditation, I think there are so many things, but you're absolutely right. You have to think about this. You have to think actively about prevention and about supporting your own cognition. And with many of the things that you and Tana have talked about in your books over the years. I, I know our, our work dovetails so yeah. beautifully. And I, I think the hope is, is you, you could, you should be on an Alzheimer's prevention program from before conception, right? Like, right? I mean, like, ultimately before conception, right? <laughs> But embedding your ideas into society as early as possible. One of the things we talked about before we came on was my work with NFL players that so many of them, they don't want to come and get scanned because they don't want to know because right. they're so worried right. about ending up with CTE or chronic Well, somehow they think blood. not knowing is going to make it better, which... Well, and that's so true with Alzheimer's right. disease. And the fact is, if you're going to play a brain damaging sport or work in a brain damaging profession, you should be doing prevention as soon as you start that. And given the numbers, Alzheimer's is expected to triple in the next 25, 30 years. Isn't that the statistic? Absolutely. And I think a statistic that really has impressed me is that if you look at the horror of COVID-19, it has now killed over half a million people, nearly 100 times the number of people who have been killed by COVID so far 
will die of Alzheimer's, the currently living Americans. So it's about 15% of the population that died. So as large as the COVID-19 pandemic has been, uh, the Alzheimer's pandemic dwarfs it in terms of the numbers. Now, of course, it's not as quick. It's over time, so people tend to forget about it. But many, many more of the currently living Americans will die from Alzheimer's than from COVID-19. So you're absolutely right. People should be on prevention for years ahead of time. And you know, Daniel and Tana, the thing that, that happens is the experts tell people, you know, there's nothing you can do about CTE and there's nothing you can do about Alzheimer's. So therefore, don't find out. And that's one of the reasons that people stick their heads in the sand. And if we could get everybody to come and find out, get on that prevention, or if you've already started down the hit, if you've already started with symptoms, get on, get on reversal, do it early. With the trial, we found that everybody could improve. The only ones who didn't were the ones who were very far along and who simply wouldn't do the appropriate things. We had you know, one person who just wouldn't get out of a house that had massive mycotoxins, for example. So the bottom line is there is a tremendous amount you can do. And that's the word that needs to get out to everybody who plays football, everyone who has head trauma, everyone who has at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Talk about the trial. Um, I know it's not published yet. Yep. But you finished it, you said, uh, in December. December. Yeah, we just finished in December. What's that? I said, how exciting. Yes. we're very, so, so this has been a while in the making. So as you can imagine, so when we were working actually back in the lab, back in 2011, we, we realized when we had developed it, we had developed a drug that looked very nice, that looked like it changed this ratio of the synaptoclastic peptides, the ones that are causing pullback, to the synaptoblastic peptides, the ones that were actually allowing you to make and keep new connections. We were very excited about that. And so we thought, okay, great, we want to test this drug. But then we realized, okay, wait, there are all these other pathways. We're really going to have to do a very comprehensive trial. So we proposed the first comprehensive trial back in 2011, and we were turned down by the IRBs. They said, you can't do a multivariable trial. It's got to be one thing. We said, well, wait, wait a minute. This is not a one thing disease. So we thought, okay, we've got to put together anecdotes. And then Daniel, just as you said, we started publishing the anecdotes. 2014, 2016, 2018, we published 100 examples uh, with documented improvement. And then in 2018, after those 100, we went back and we got turned down again by the IRBs, because everybody wants you to do these single variable trials, which really don't, doesn't make sense. Finally, 2019, we got okayed for a small proof of concept trial. This will now lead to a much bigger trial. So this first one was just 25 people, but we very extensively evaluated each one. And you know, you flip the script just as you do with your, with your NFL players that you've looked at. You're flipping the script to say, instead of predetermining a treatment, which really makes no sense in cognitive decline, why give everyone the exact same thing? We're saying, why did each person get this? In some case, it was their leaky gut. In some cases, it was metabolic syndrome. In some cases, a number of these people had mycotoxins. Some of them had tick-borne illnesses. You've got to, as you well know, you've got to address the things that are causing it. So we did that for all these 25 people. They had extensive evaluations. They went on a precision medicine protocol. We finished in December and the vast majority of them showed an improvement. And I wanna make one important point here. There was a huge announcement three weeks ago from Eli Lilly in which they said, we didn't make people better with our drug donanumab. We didn't even stabilize people, but we slowed the decline by one third. And in one day, the stock for that company rose by $20 billion for the total value of the company because of saying we slowed it by one third. Well, mm -hmm. our results were far, far superior to that. We're making people actually better. So that's, that's what that tells me. What that tells me is people are desperate. They're looking for hope. And exactly. we just have to make sure that the message we have, you're not stuck with the brain you have, you can make it better with a comprehensive program um, that we just have to keep hammering that over and over again. We got to go to the next podcast, but we are so grateful. Uh, we're with Dr. Dale Bredesen, the author of The End of Alzheimer's and um, the end of Alzheimer's program. You have a new book coming out in August. What's that called again? 
called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Great stories from seven wow. people who wrote their own stories. Just fantastic. Yeah, I <laughs> love that. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are still here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, um, talking about his amazing program, The End of Alzheimer's. He's got the book and the program. And I love, we were talking about your clinical trial in the last episode, Dr. Bredesen, and you talked about something, which I think, you know, we've been talking about for a long time. You've been talking about for a long time, but not a lot of people have been talking about for a long time. And it's really about treating the underlying causes that Alzheimer's isn't one thing. Um, so I, I just, I love this idea that, you know, to get people well, we've got to treat the underlying causes rather than putting band-aids over bullet holes, if you will, right, um, right. trying to use the shotgun effect. Well, and how do you know unless you look? Right. Um, exactly. You know, a major business principle is you can't change what you don't measure. And we, you know, it's why we do imaging because we're measuring and I think, and the research backs it up, we can tell years, maybe decades before you have any symptoms if your brain is headed for darkness. I'm getting ready to publish a new study on happiness. And if you have low frontal lobe function, you're not happy. Uh, it's pretty clear brain health goes with happiness, but it also goes with memory. What, what are some of the important numbers you think people should know on a routine basis? important health numbers. Yeah, well, I'd say, first of all, um, certainly agree with the, the point that, that, that Tana made that you, know, you, you need, really need to look at these things. You really need to go after what's causing. And as you said, there are critical numbers. And years ago, you, know, you had the tremendous you know, critical insight that with psychiatry, you're not looking at what actually changes. And the spec scans change that. So you can now actually see, you can see what COVID does, you can see what Alzheimer's does, and you can see it coming which is really critical. And so we're doing very much the same thing biochemically. So we want people to, to know what their TGF beta one is, because that is a critical piece for their, their product, their ability to deal with inflammation. We want them to know things like their HSCRP. We want them, and the good news is, by the way, there are so many of these wearables now that we can find out a number of these things. We want them to know how their sleep is going. We really, one of the most important things for people to know is their nocturnal oximetry. There's a beautiful study published just a couple of years ago showing if you simply take the mean oxygen saturation, the average through the night, that correlates beautifully with the size of specific nuclei within your brain, including your hippocampus. Oh, wow. So as your oxygenation goes down at night, and unfortunately so many people don't check, your brain is shrinking and that's a major issue. We'd like to know- How do people check that? So people can do that a number of ways. You can either do it um, by with things like, you can do it with an Apple Watch, that'll actually, you wear that at night, it'll tell you what your oxygen status is while you're sleeping. You can do it with a simple oximeter, which you can buy inexpensively, or you can borrow from your physician. You can do it with a sleep study. If there's any question about your sleeping, good idea to have a sleep study. They will check that for you. So there are numerous ways to do that, but one way or the other, critical to know that. And another critical thing to know is your oral microbiome. You know, we, of course, we talk so much now about the gut microbiome and how important it is, but of course, also your sinus microbiome and your oral microbiome. And one of the things that's been found by the pathologists repeatedly in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease is P. gingivalis, a specific bacterium from your mouth that actually gets into your brain. This all, by the way, also goes systemically. It, it is part of you know, your cardiovascular disease. It can contribute to cancers. It's, it's been remarkable. You, what's going on in your mouth, the inflammation that's going on, periodontitis, gingivitis, absolutely critical for your cognition. 
And so therefore, you can check this easily with an oral DNA test. You can look to see whether you have low levels of this in your microbiome or high levels. And there are a few other bad, bad ones, T. denticola, P. intermedia, this is a Prevotella species, F. nucleatum. These are all the bad actors in your mouth that can unfortunately get into your brain. And then of course, toxic burden. And I know you've talked about that many times. So many of us have toxic burden, whether it's more on the metal, whether it's air pollution. And of course, here in California with the fires, huge issue with air pollution. There was a, you probably saw there was a follow-up study on the people who'd been in the World Trade Center. And they're now up to 14% of these people have cognitive decline because of the exposure to that air pollution. Even though it was so brief, still enough to increase risk for cognitive decline. Wow. And then there's the organics, of course, the glyphosates and things like that. And then, of course, the mycotoxins. So all of these things are critical to know. And then things like your heart rate variability. Again, easy to check. And if you're walking around here at 15 or 20 day in and day out, you have, you're under a lot of stress and you're not going to do as well in the long run. So the good news is, just as you said, we can now measure and follow these things. I just checked my oxygenation on my Apple Watch for a week. Good. 97%. Perfect. I guess. Yeah, while you sleep? Um, it's throughout. Because mm. uh, yeah. I think we want to know specifically while we sleep, correct? And sleep apnea triples the risk of Alzheimer's. Yeah. Disease. So there's a, I actually yeah. on spec scans, I can tell if you have sleep apnea because it's really like early Alzheimer's disease. Really? You get this parietal lobe Saturday and so decreases yeah. in the parietal lobe, one of the first areas that die in Alzheimer's disease. Don't you think? I think people are actually being diagnosed later in the course of the illness because of their phones. It used to be when I first started in practice. I get a patient referred to me for Alzheimer's disease because they lost their way home and in a city they lived in for 30 years. Well, now nobody loses their way home because you can just tell your phone, take me home yeah. and maps will take them home. So I actually think our gadgets are getting us later diagnoses than we had before because people can sort of fudge their memory. This is such a good point. And you know that the people on the one hand, they are absolutely being diagnosed later because there are so many workarounds now. But interestingly, they're also being diagnosed younger. So that's a, that's a scary combination. Wow. When, I, when I was training back in the 80s at UC San Francisco, we never saw people in their 50s with Alzheimer's disease. This, were, you know, this was a disease of late 60s, 70s, 80s. We see one of the most common things we see now is a 52 year old person with Alzheimer's disease. Incredibly. Right. And so, and in fact, that's, that was reported uh, with an epidemiological study about a year ago that they're seeing the same thing more and more young. But Daniel, you brought up something really interesting. If you don't mind, I want to ask you a key question here. So you brought up the biparietal look. And of course, on PET scans, you typically see it's temporal and parietal. But what's really interesting. So here's my question for you. When we see people who have a largely biparietal, not so much temporal look, so not so it's a non-amnestic presentation with things like apraxias and agnosias and PCA and things like that, uh, executive dysfunction of the parietal type rather than the frontal type, t these people typically turn out to have toxic exposure as opposed to a more inflammatory or metabolic syndrome. So do you see in your patients who have cognitive decline, do you see a group that is much more biparietal than temporoparietal? Yes. And, and I think of them as, you know, I have to wonder about sleep apnea. So that's the yeah. first thing I think about, but you also wonder if they've been dropped on their head because yeah. traumatic brain injury is a major cause of dementia that very few people talk about because they're not looking at functional scans. Yeah. They look at structural things that often don't show them. For our listeners, you guys need to translate this. Okay, so <laughs> biparietal just means on both sides, okay. so bilateral, both sides. Show them where. Of your parietal lobe, top, back, part of your brain that's involved with direct sense. 
Yes. And it's also involved in recognizing when you have a problem, especially the yep. non side of the brain. Versus Usually your temporal. The right, versus your temporal lobes underneath your temples and behind your eyes. And on the inside of your temporal lobes, that's what dies in Alzheimer's disease, right. is this very special part of the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, that is one of the very few parts of the brain that produce new baby cells every day. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. So you're actually making 700 new baby cells every day. And mm -hmm. if you're starting them of oxygen because you have sleep apnea, well, you're murdering yeah. them. Or if you're smoking weed, I'm like not a huge fan of all weed being smoked because it shrinks the hippocampus. Great point. And the way we tend to see them is the ones who have the temporal parietal come in with memory problems. The ones that have the biparietal, as you said, kind of back here without the temporal don't have the memory problems. They have the problems with calculation and they have the problem with planning. And they have the problem with recognizing other people's faces. And they mm. often are the earlier ones in their early 50s. So oh. those are the sorts of things that make me look. So that's very interesting that uh, it really, uh, you know, it really makes you think about sleep apnea. That's a great point. So very interesting. Thank you. Well, and what the problem has been is we can say what it is. So it's Alzheimer's, but we're not saying why. It why? Is. And it's exactly. the why That's the most that important got thing. screwed up because everybody was saying it's beta amyloid plaque deposition and your work and the work of a lot of people who publish in the Journal of Alzheimer's is that's complete nonsense because beta amyloid may actually be a protective uh, deposition from so mold exposure or infections. And if so you don't go the after thing. the right. why, you'll never fix the problem. Exactly. So we, we have to go on to the next podcast. It's so interesting. We could talk all day. In fact, we've got two more to do. We are here with Dr. Dale Bredesen, author of the international best-selling book, The End of Alzheimer's, The End of Alzheimer's Program. And um, the new book in August is The First Survivors okay. of, of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. I love that so title right. gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. Your brain is always listening. I am thrilled to be your guide and show you how to tame your dragons so that you can have the happiness, peace, and the relationships you deserve. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Dale Bredesen, and we're talking about his work, his new study, uh, the impact of the pandemic on your brain. What do you think, Dale, the impact of isolation on so many people in care facilities um, has been where they were getting regular visits from their family and all of a sudden it stopped? Yeah, great point. And if I may, just to go back to a point you made in the last segment, uh, when you say the word Alzheimer's or the term Alzheimer's disease, that should never be followed by a period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the 1600s, people died from fever. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. that was a perfectly acceptable thing to say. Yeah, he or she died from fever. Love that. Now, of course, we understand we say fever due to what? Pneumococcus due to COVID-19, what it is. So the people should be doing the same with Alzheimer's. You should never say someone has Alzheimer's and then have a period. Right. Alzheimer's due to what? Now, you brought up the point about what happens to the facilities when people are there. About 80% of the people who enter those facilities have some cognitive changes. And we're actually now just in the middle of setting up a program so that there can be improvements. And there's a wonderful place in San Diego called Marama, M-A-R-A-M-A, -A -A, set up by Dr. Heather Sanderson. Uh, and I think you know Heather, uh, who uh, that works with uh, people in uh, residential assisted living and tries to improve them. And she's seeing wonderful results with people in the facility. So that's the way of the future. And you're right, when people stop coming, there is more anxiety. There is, unfortunately, people go downhill more rapidly. There's less social networking. 
there's less of a reason. Of course, there's less of a reason to live. That's the bottom line. You need that support. Just as uh, Professor Mike Mersnick has pointed out over the years with his wonderful brain training that he developed, you have to have that use of this amazing 500 trillion synapse network that you have inside your skull. And you've got to have stimulation of that. And of course, just as you've seen and we've seen as well, when we treat these people with cognitive decline, the ones that do the best are the ones that have some form of stimulation included in the overall program. Whether you like violite, whether you like magnetic stimulation, whether it's social interaction, whether it's brain training or all of the above, this is really helpful. And so you're right, losing that is a real problem. I love what you said about it should never be followed by a period. And I know you've been saying that forever about depression, anxiety, even Alzheimer's. Um, that, you, that it's, it's all of it's things. many things. None of the mental health uh, problems are single or simple disorders. There There's are an underlying there are many cause. roads to it. And I love Dale, your analogy. It's like you have a roof and there's not one leak. It's like there's 36 different leaks. And if you don't go plug all of them, you're not going to have a dry house. Absolutely. And there's a threshold. You know, again, just as Dr. Dean Ornish showed 35 years ago, when you're trying to reverse atherosclerosis, you have got to get over that threshold. There's a threshold. You're putting down this plaque. You're putting down the plaque. And it's because you've got more putting down than taking up. you got to get at some point you're going to get on the, uh, the good side of that threshold. And of course, you see the same thing with things like depression and autism. We see the same thing with cognitive decline. People are on the wrong side where they're synaptoclastic. They're pulling back signals outweigh their synaptoblastic, just as you have with osteoporosis, where you got too much uptake of bone and not enough putting it down. Same thing with synaptic formation and maintenance. And so you've got to do everything possible to get over that threshold. Now you start to see actual improvement and, you know, it's not uh, magic. It's simply biochemistry and neurochemistry. You need to address that. And then you start to see people improving. So exciting. What are some of the practical things you think people should be doing every day to maintain their brain? Yeah. And I think, you know, you've written about this beautifully and extensively over the years. Um, and I think that there's a whole host of things that so many of us tend to forget. And, you know, it really does start uh, with honoring some of our ancestral uh, traits and basically the things that, that, that give us our humanness. You know, we, we were built evolutionarily, and we see this beautifully with ApoE4, for example, because all of us were ApoE4-4, the very thing that we think of as high risk for Alzheimer's. That was all we had as hominids for 96% of our evolution. And it's just the last 4%, last 220,000 years, ApoE3 appeared, and then the last 80,000 years, ApoE2 appeared. So honoring your ancestral, the, the way that we were designed evolutionarily, and that starts with getting appropriate sleep, just as you indicated what you see on your SPECT scans when people have sleep apnea is a huge issue. So many people don't realize it. So that's the first thing to do. Find out where you stand with your sleep. And then getting up at an appropriate time and going to bed at an appropriate time. You know, we really, again, we were, we were made not to be burning the midnight oil, staying up half. And of course, anyone who trained as an intern and a resident, unfortunately, had to stay up. I have no question I did my brain a lot of damage by being in an intern and a resident in, in medicine and neurology years and years ago, because you're staying up all night, night after night after night, very bad for your brain. Yeah. And then knowing your, where you stand with a number of your biochemical parameters. You know, we, I wasn't trained as a nutritionist, I'm, so I'm just trying to get people to get the optimal biochemistry. You want to have your omega-3 index being up at 10%, 11%, not down at 4 or 5%. Uh, that's a critical thing, knowing that, being able to make those things that are going to help you resolve inflammation. And then so, a yeah, lot of I did a yeah. study at Amen Clinics where I worked with Bill Harris, uh, who created the Omega-3 Index. Uh, we gave it to 
50 consecutive patients who came to Amen mm -hmm. Clinics who were not on fish oil. 49 of them had suboptimal levels. I mean, it was wow. just insane. And it's so simple yeah. to just take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. On, I mean, I do it every day. We make something called omega-3 power squeeze with high levels of EPA and DHA. And I just put it in the smoothie every day. It's just so simple yeah. because, and my level's always around 12. So um, you want to be. it's just a simple, easy thing to do. And whenever you do one thing, you're more likely to do another. Thing. Right. As you feel better, you're going to start improving and doing more. Well, you know, you have an incentive to do it. You know, you start feeling better. You start having more energy. And I do think, you know, that's another issue. You can find out your ketone status very easily. And we do find that people who are getting themselves into mild ketosis do better overall with their cognition. And certainly for anyone who actually has some cognitive decline, <laughs> Check it out. You can now do it. You don't have to necessarily stick your finger. You can do it with a breathalyzer. There's a group called Biosense. It's put out a nice breathalyzer that's actually quite accurate. And so blowing those above you know, seven aces, a uh, good idea to make sure, again, if you have cognitive decline, even more important, but a good idea to get into mild ketosis and getting yourself insulin sensitive. Getting rid of the sugar. I am telling you, when I even I don't measure my ketones every day and do all that, but I know my body when I start eating carbs, like during quarantine, yeah. you get lazy and you start eating, carbs. and I'm eating quote unquote healthy carbs. But if I eat too many of them, I instantly don't feel good. I feel yeah. bleh. My, you know, I feel I have brain fog. And then I do, I go back on my keto program. I do my yeah. MCP oil and do all that stuff and, you know, go back on my program and eat a lot of plant based fat. And yeah. within a day or two, I'm just like, Bing, it's like Lazarus effect. Absolutely. And I think this is something, again, most of us don't think about it. And we're out there, we're getting too many carbs. It's just no question. And again, it's what's interesting to me is we take these things that are actually, we, we were not designed evolutionarily to eat that many carbs. And yet we've gotten so used to it. You know, I don't know if you've seen this wonderful uh, this wonderful series on uh, National Geographic, uh, which is called The Food That Built America. And it's it's really fascinating The Heinz, how Heinz set up the catch up, how the, how the chips came to be, how McDonald's and Ray Kroc developed, and how the, the pizza groups developed, all these things. And what's interesting about these, in each of these cases, they became billion sellers largely because they had carbs in them that people yeah. craved. And so, yes. And the more it, you eat, the more you crave. And it yep. raises serotonin, which makes you feel good in the short run, but it also increases Blood inflammation sugar and insulin and that makes you feel bad in the long run. Right. All right, when we come back, we're gonna have our final segment with Dr. Bredesen and we're gonna talk more about practical ways to keep your brain. Yeah. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are still here with our friend and colleague, Dr. Dale Bredesen, talking about his program and his just groundbreaking work in Alzheimer's, um, his program, The End of Alzheimer's. He's got a new book coming out in August, The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Um, so exciting. And in the last episode, I got super excited because you're speaking my language now. Um, we're talking about diet and um, how ketosis really helps you know, the brain. And I just know from a day-to-day -day level, with my energy, with my memory, with how I feel in general, what I can get done in a day. When I cut out 
any kind of simple carbs, I just feel significantly better. So I know we're going to move on on the topic, but I just think this is such an important point. That is something you can do today. That is something you have control of today. So, you know, you can put your body into this light state of ketosis and you just focus on eating healthy fats. So I just, I don't want to minimize that. Absolutely. And, you know, we found with the, both with the truck, and, and the book, these, the, the, in the book, there are seven people who were all told they had Alzheimer's disease. Uh, many of them had a very positive family histories, were having trouble at work, were having trouble with their children, were having trouble doing so many different things. Uh, and, and were told by their doctors, you're getting Alzheimer's, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, then they started the, the protocol that we, that, that we developed and we interact with them over time. And then they started getting better and better very exciting. And they wrote these wonderful stories, wonderful first person stories about what it feels like to have cognitive decline, how you manage day to day that we all hear repeatedly, and then what it feels like to begin to notice. And often you hear at first, you don't believe it. Like, wait a minute, am I really better? Am I really finding it easier to navigate around my neighborhood? Am I really getting more, uh, you know, more ability to remember these various things? phone numbers and addresses and things like that. And then wait a minute, I, I'm back. And then they start to kind of feel like, wow, I'm really back. So it's a very exciting, I have to say, it's been the, the thing that I've enjoyed the most is to see people start to get better and you know, write about their own improvement. It's just so, it, it is glorious uh, to see this and to see the interaction with their families and for them to then turn to their children and say, you don't have to worry about this problem. A grandfather died of this. Uh, mother died of this. Um, I'm now going to do better and you don't have to worry about it anymore. I love that. And I want to just point something out because when you start to eat clean and you cut some of that stuff out of your diet, we know inflammation is one of the, the big culprits, right? Inflammation is terrible for your brain. It's terrible when you know, we're talking about the, Alzheimer's. One of your types of Alzheimer's. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, Type one. When, yeah. So when you cut out processed foods and sugar and some of the simple carbs we're talking about, when you do, and you know, floss. and you, right. But I'm talking about food right now. So when you talk about these, these healthy foods, like you will feel the inflammation come down quickly. When you jump on the scale and two days later, you're down four pounds. It's not likely that you lost a bunch of fat. It's likely that you lost a bunch of inflammation, right? right. So you're, you're losing this inflammation. You feel it immediately and you immediately feel better. That is something you can control today. So I like that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this is a critical part of this. And the one message I think is so important for people to understand is please don't give up the arsenal. This is what's changed. We've all been told by the experts in the past that there is nothing that you can do. And therefore, forget, just as you said, Daniel, earlier about CTE, that everyone's told there's nothing you can do. And so people will try something, maybe a new program, and then they say, oh, it's not working immediately. I'm going to give up. Please stick with it. The, the arsenal is huge. You can continue to tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak. And we're now looking at other neurodegenerative diseases and looking at the unique biochemistry for each one to look at how can we now get these people on the right side of their curve. And between you know, all the different things that can be done with diet, with exercise, with sleep, with stress, with toxicity, with brain training, with vascular improvement, all of these things are available now. And things like stem cells, plasmalogens, uh, plasmapheresis. There's some really interesting work now being done out of UCSF looking at plasmapheresis in people. So again, one of these things by itself, probably not the cure, but getting the right thing, getting your orchestra tuned up basically has given the best results. Please don't give up. So both you and I have pioneered uh, a new way of thinking. Um, how have the academic people responded um, to your work and how have you managed it personally? Yeah, this is a great point. You know, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, so what's happened is, you know, that there are, there, there are the three phases. The first phase is they ignore you, right? The second phase is they get angry and they fight you. And then the third phase is that uh, they say, we've known this all along. Right. I think so, the second phase, they try to kill you, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. 
So we are, the good news is we're now into the second phase. They're writing nasty things in uh, Lancet Neurology, for example, uh, that, you know, it's never right. You didn't do enough patients and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. So I'm happy to say that they're very angry and very threatened. But the reality is you and I both know that treating a complex illness with a simple pill makes absolutely no sense. And I do think the pills are gonna be very important, but when used appropriately, knowing the biochemistry and addressing the other things. So if you've got a roof with 36 holes in it, then in fact, the pill is a great way to cover one hole, but it's not gonna do very well unless you cover the other 35. And that's exactly what we're doing. And you gotta figure out what are the big ones and what are the little ones for each person. So things are changing, but right now, yeah, uh, a lot of marginalization, a lot of anger. And yeah, for me personally, I have no question it's affected my SPECT scan. I have no question it's affected my <laughs> campus, my amygdala, all of these sorts of things. So yeah, it's it's been painful because a lot of these are my old, my old colleagues, my old friends who are really, really angry. Uh, it's interesting, you know, well, especially my grants. That if you get the notoriety, if- people talk about you, um, then they get jealous and they get angry because they're not the ones getting the praise. Um, but what matters 19, is the patients getting In 1962, out. Thomas Kuhn wrote a great book on um, the structure of scientific revolution. And he talks about five phases. And right. phase number one, is you identify a problem. Yeah. It's like standard of care isn't working. And as a neurologist, seeing patients with Alzheimer's disease, you're like, this stuff isn't working. And in fact, if you go on medications like Aricep, they seem to help for a couple of months. And over time, people actually get worse than if they were not on them at all. So step two is people start to um, fight about what's the fix. And yep. the standard, uh, the status quo people make small modifications. Like in my field, the DSM, we now have six versions of it. Um, but it's really essentially not changed since DSM-3. And then the third one is a new model is born based on experience, usually not from academic centers, uh, because it's hard to think outside of the box when you're inside of the walls of the box. And the fourth one is the most predictable of all the stages, and that's the rejection. Yeah. And then the fifth one, because the guard dies, Max Planck said that, that progress in science happens through funerals. Uh, A new generation grows up and it's accepted. And I absolutely see you're actually in stage four, that you already have the model, um, right? I mean, the Alzheimer's, it doesn't work. The traditional treatment, it's a fraud, if you will. And... People are trying to like scramble to go, no, it really is beta amyloid. Um, And uh, you have a new model. It's really clear. And now people hate you, which is awesome. We don't hate you. We love you. (laughs) Feelings mutual. You just have to stay the course. And for me, it was always the stories Mm -hmm. of transformation that kept me going. And I just stop paying attention to yeah. the haters. And as long as I don't pay attention to them, I sleep just fine. <laughs> if when I engage, I mean, I really engage because how do you know unless you look? Are you insane? I'm a psychiatrist. I know how to diagnose insanity and not wanting more information. That's insane. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I, I don't put myself in a situation often to get angry. It's a great point, you know, and uh, one of my very favorite sayings actually came from a rabbi who said, you are not expected to complete your life's work during your lifetime. Neither are you excused from it. 
Oh, and you know, we're all fighting the good, good fight. And now, you know, I'm, I'm just about to turn 70. And so, you know, I, I'm thinking, hey, this is going to go on long after I'm gone. If we can do the best we can to make the major neurodegenerative disease diseases preventable and treatable, then I will be very happy that people are doing better. Because this, as you know, this has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. People dying of ALS, of Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, Alzheimer's disease, just go on and on. PSP, you know, these are horrible, horrible diseases that when we all trained were considered untreatable. So, you know, we're making some major inroads into these and it's just wonderful to see. And I hope it continues. By the way, your skin looks amazing. I cannot believe you are about to be 70. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's uh, all the things that you guys are teaching me. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have been with our friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen. We are grateful for his work, for his friendship. We feel like we're on the same path with a better brain. Always comes a better life. With a better brain comes a better memory, comes a better mood, comes better relationships, better money, better sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. And his book, The End of Alzheimer's, is just brilliant. Uh, um, there's just not one thing I disagreed with. I'd like, this is awesome. We recommend it to everyone. And uh, thank you, Dale. It's great seeing you again. I'm always thinking of ways we should be working together because we just opened our ninth clinic in Dallas. Oh, it's so busy. It's yeah. so busy and it's what people want. People want yeah. better brains so they can have better lives. Yes, and it's an area that is such need. I mean, there's so many places now that are considered quote centers of excellence that are really centers of non-excellence. So mm -hmm. in fact, having these places where people can actually go get prevention, get reversal, these mm -hmm. are huge. So congratulations on the new center. Always great talking to you guys. There's so much new, I think this is, you know, the field is continuing to evolve. We're all seeing it in real time, getting better and better results. So very, very enthusiastic about the upcoming years. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Tana. Always Thank great you. to see you too. You all too. right. Take care, Dan. Bye. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're interested in coming to Amen Clinics, use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.